meeting is being recorded. This meeting is being recorded. Hello and welcome to today's program, Spain and her colonies involvement in the American Revolution. My name is Maddie Gallen and I'm the director of, of operations at the Independence Historical Trust. Today's program is co-hosted by Independence National Historical Park and the Independence Historical Trust. We are the philanthropic partner to the National Park. And if you'd like to learn more about us, feel free to visit us at our website at inht.org. Just some housekeeping for everybody uh, tuning in today. Uh, we are recording this, as you can tell. Uh, it will be posted on the Trust website after the fact and also posted to our Facebook page if you'd like to watch it again or share it with others. Uh, if you have a question during the presentation, feel free to type it into the Q&A chat box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, the questions will be asked during the Q&A portion at the end of the presentation. I uh, want to thank you again for joining us today. And now I'm going to hand it over to Supervisory Park Ranger, Carl Schickenberg. Carl? Yeah, good morning, everyone. And good afternoon, Tom, and in, in uh, Spain. Uh, on behalf of the National Park Service, we're very glad you're here today uh, in this webinar with us. Uh, this originated as a kind of a training session for my staff, but uh, we realized with the opportunity presented us by the Historic Trust, the Independence Historical Trust, that we could reach a wider audience, which is a wonderful thing. So I just want to start that by, by saying, um, as public servants at a World Heritage Site and the birthplace of the United States, we, the Rangers here at Independence National Historical Park, owe it to our visitors to present American history in an honest way, as free from bias as possible. In doing so, we recognize as best as we can the contributions of all who were part of the American Revolution and the founding of this country. Since he first visited us here at Independence in 2011, I believe that Tom Chavez has been responsible over the years for our staff's improved understanding regarding the role that Hispanic people, Spain, and her colonies played during the founding of the United States. One of the hallmarks of a good interpretive ranger is their ability to forge a connection between the visitor and the resource. So for example, when one of our rangers here is giving a tour to a school group from California, the ranger can explain to the kids now how people living in California in the 1780s contributed to the American Revolution by paying taxes to support the war. But I'll let Tom explain that further. This is his show. Um, just a few words about our, our guest, Tom Chavez. He is the author of Spain and the Independence of the United States, an intrinsic gift. Dr. Chavez recently retired as the director of the National Hispanic Cultural Center of New Mexico. He was also director of the prestigious Palace of the Governor's Museum in Santa Fe, New Mexico for over 20 years. In addition to being the author of 11 books, he has also published numerous articles and book reviews. He has two more books forthcoming, and I was honored to have a peek at them uh, recently. One is uh, Benjamin Franklin and Spain, a history. Uh, the other is Benjamin Franklin documents in the archives of Spain. In 2017, he was inducted into the order of Isabel la Católica by the Spanish government. He now resides in Malaga, Spain. So, all right, Tom, uh, you're up. I'm gonna share screen, start the slides. Okay, tell me when. Okay, host disabled screen sharing. All right. Am I sharing my screen? Sorry about that, you should be good now. Okay, let me try it again. Yeah. Back it up, share screen. There you go. We, you can see my uh, PowerPoint now, right? Yes. All right, here we go. Am I on? You're on. Okay, well, first of all, I wanna thank you, Carl, for inviting me back. Uh, and I gotta say, when the first time you invited me and I spoke at Independ in Independence Hall, it was like a highlight of my career to be speaking from the very spot that John Adams uh, 
kind of got bored watching the arguments of the, of the new delegates. Um, and um, I'll, I'll, it just it was a high point of my career. So I want to thank the uh, Independence National Trust for, for uh, agreeing to put this on and extend it out to a wider audience. Um, it's just a real privilege to do this. And um, I would do it from anywhere in the world uh, at, at, your, at your liege. Uh, and so thank you. Um, Spain and you know not a lot of people in, in our country, meaning the United States, uh, know that uh, Spain was involved in our War of Independence, and and I and I say that War of Independence because uh, when I went to Spain uh, to do the research on this topic, I announced at the archive there that I was uh, researching Spain's uh, help in the in the American Revolution. Now, we all know what the American Revolution means to us, but uh, in Spain, they, they looked at me and asked you and said, uh, which revolution? Uh, because Spain has suffered more than a few American revolutions. And so I had to explain the uh, War of Independence for the 13 British colonies against Great Britain. Um, and then we went from there. Uh, and it turns out that Spain uh, has a lot of information in its archives about our war of independence. And I was lucky to be one of the first, not the first, but one of the first to, to do research on, on, on the topic. Um, you know, the first map up here uh, kind of explains what we're going to focus on. But I'm going to I'm going to talk a little bit broader this because Spain did get involved in the war. Uh, Spain was involved in many ways. It, it financed the war to a great great extent. Its soldiers and sailors fought British uh, soldiers and sailors in the war, so they they let blood uh, in the war. Um, and uh, diplomatically, they tried to prevent the war before it even started. Um, before they got involved with it, it had already started. So they were involved in the war in all kinds of ways that our founding fathers knew about. Uh, but so for somehow it was forgotten in, in the historiography of our country. Um, and so, you know, in the bigger picture, uh, Spain and France had just lost a war to Great Britain, the Seven Years' War that we know of as the French and Indian War. Uh, to put it simply, Great Britain is, is, a, is a lousy winner. They tend to taunt their, <laughs> their, the people they just beat to death. Um, and um, they were expanding into Central America. Uh, they were expanding into what uh, then was called Guatemala, which included Nicaragua. Um, and um, they had the, the idea of maybe even uh, digging a canal uh, up the uh, San Juan, the Nicaragua River to the lake there where there's just an 11 mile stretch to the Pacific Ocean that they could dig. And Spain was watching all this going on when they could do nothing because they just lost a war. They just lost the Floridas. Um, and of course, France lost almost everything in, in the Americas except for some Caribbean islands. Um, and, um, you know, and then also Britain was in Gibraltar as they are today. They had the Mediterranean island of Menorca, which is off the Spanish coast. So there were all these things that, that was going on and that uh, Spain resented it, as well as France. Um, and uh, Spain was really concerned uh, about what, what Britain's designs were. They expected Britain to declare war on them at some point to claim land in Central America, for example, because if they, if they, if they took Guatemala and the real uh, San Juan de Nicaragua and that lake, even if they didn't dig the canal, they could transport goods from the Pacific to the Atlantic side over 11 miles really easily. And of course, that would interfere with the Manila Galleon, which was a Spanish monopoly to Asia, at least going in that direction. And so um, all this stuff plays into what became our independence, believe it or not. Um, so the English aggression uh, was, was a concern. Carlos III, whom you can show now, um, next, next there he is. Um, Carlos III, uh, he was a really interesting guy. He is still probably the most favorite of uh, Spanish kings in Spain. He was an enlightened man, even though he doesn't, he look, kind of looks like Ichabod Crane or something, you know, uh, he looks kind of goofy, but uh, he was a very intelligent, enlightened man and started promoting people into his ministries, not because of uh, their bloodlines, but more because of what their intelligence was. And um, he, he uh, was the major urban reformer of, of the Spanish crown. He started reforming all the Americas. He was concerned about British uh, 
aggressions. When he first took the crown, he made the mistake at the end of the Seven Years' War of joining it um, to fulfill the uh, agreements that Spain had with, with uh, France. Um, but he learned from that. He would never again get into a war so quick. Uh, his was a policy of patience. And uh, one of the major uh, people that uh, um, would follow that policy of patience is coming up. Now, his, his, uh, this, this is Louis XVI. He jumped ahead of me there. Um, Louis XVI actually is related to Carlos III. They're both, uh, they're both Bourbon, uh, um, you know, of, of the Bourbon family. Um, Carlos III is actually the great uncle of Louis XVI. And, um, and, and a lot, and when the war, when they finally get involved with the Revolutionary War, he's, he's a lot older. And so there is correspondence where um, Louis XVI of France is asking Carlos III for his advice about getting into the war and so forth. So it's kind of interesting that we tend to think from our point of view that our, our founding fathers uh, rebelled and then uh, France came to our aid and France was this powerhouse in Europe and, and did it on its own. And that's the, the, the furthest uh, from the truth that actually happened. Um, so uh, Louis the Sixteenth uh, uh, was a younger king, and because they lost that Seven Years' War, and because of uh, of um, Britain's uh, kind of taunting and, and um, ruling the seas and so forth, and their their corsairs raiding uh, um, French ships, uh, Louis the Sixteenth was pretty much anxious to get back at that Britain. Um, he was like the, the kid on the block who just got pummeled, but he's going to get up and fight again no matter what and get pummeled again, whereas his great uncle is, is expressing uh, patience. Now, I'm, I'm doing this in a general sense, and we'll get to some detail here. Um, Carlos III had you know, promoted around him advisors uh, that were also enlightened men. And, uh, and they, um, they uh, you know, followed his policy. The, the most uh, obvious of this for our purposes is Jose Mourinho, Mourinho Redondo, the Count of Florida Blanca. And this is him, uh, blue-eyed uh, Count. Um, he was the Minister of State for, for Spain. He uh, spoke for the King and the King trusted him implicitly. Um, he, um, had the, he, he engineered the whole policy of patience um, that almost, in the end, almost uh, negotiated independence for the, uh, for the colonies before Spain even got into the war. And we'll get to that in a second. Um, he had working at his side a man called Jose Galvez, uh, and we're going to talk about him a lot. Um, and Jose Galvez, another enlightened man from southern Spain, um, in, a, in a family that is, that is uh, really interesting because all his brothers and nephew got involved in, in all of this in some way or another. And you're going to hear about a couple of them coming up. Uh, Jose Galvez was the minister of the Indies, the Indies being the Americas. From the Spanish point of view, the Americas is the Indies, the West Indies, uh, the East Indies being India and so forth. And at the time, Florida Blanca was interested in protecting the Manila Galleon and, and of course, this, its richest colony, uh, or if you want to call it province, uh, which was Mexico, then called New Spain. Um, but he was also looking at diverting the trade, the Manila Galleon trade, by um, competing with, with um, Portugal and England and going south around the African point and east uh, to the Indies as well. And so they were looking at they were actually testing those routes now uh, at, at the same time. And then, of course, then there's the, the British idea of, of cutting the, the Spanish Empire in half with its canal idea. So he's the guy that's overseeing all this. And then Jose Galvez, was the minister of the Indies, who's particularly involved in the Indies and, of course, Guatemala uh, and what's going to happen with New Spain, which is right next to the 13 colonies and so forth uh, that's going on and uh, managing Louisiana which at the time was Spanish territory as well. So St. Louis is a Spanish town, New Orleans is a Spanish town, but because of the Seven Years' War, uh, Britain claimed up to the Mississippi River banks all the land there and started putting um, uh, settlements and forts opposite the Spanish uh, settlements and forts, another form of British uh, aggression as Spain saw it. Uh, also uh, because of the Seven Years' War, um, 
Britain uh, took over Pensacola, Florida, which was a major port, port at that time in the Gulf of Mexico. So all of this is going on. Uh, another another uh, person that uh, we need to mention in some detail um, is uh, Pedro Pablo Abarca de Volea. You don't have to remember these long names. Don't take notes, folks. Uh, just he's the Count of Aranda, and there he is. Um, the Count of Aranda. <laughs> he actually looks like his personality was. <laughs> he. Uh, he, um, even the king of Spain uh, said there was no, there, he was as stubborn as, a, as an Aragonés mule. Um, very intelligent man, long uh, military career, wounded in battle, very loyal to the crown, but a pain in the neck to be around because he could turn an argument on its heels and extend it forever if he wanted to. Um, and um, and uh, he kind of, you know, showed off his intelligence, if you will. And so um, he was... In a sense, the, the uh, Florida de Blanca came up with a perfect solution for the guy. He made him the ambassador of Spain to Paris, to France. And so he got him out of Spain and away from the Spanish court, but put him in a, in a key position because of his intelligence and loyalty. He's the guy who negotiated with the United States through Benjamin Franklin. He and Benjamin Franklin sat down a lot and talked to each other and, uh, and exchanged correspondence. Benjamin Franklin uh, supped in his um, well-endowed uh, residence in Paris many times. And actually, this guy kept notes. And you know, the first meeting with Franklin uh, lasted, actually, Silas Dean and Arthur Lee were there, too, lasted a couple of hours. And this guy wrote a 13-page report of that first meeting that's in the archives of Spain. And so, and he was pro-American. He was pro uh, in support of the colonies and actually wanted to get involved in the war more than Florida de Blanca or the King did. But he made his arguments and he made them openly and in writing. So um, he becomes an important person and he was more than aware of what was going on in Central America, which was probably why he wanted to, to get into, get declare war on Britain and, and, and stymie that. So those, those are some of the key players that come up. Now, what happened is Spain um, supported the colonies before it got into the war. It was a neutral country sending covert aid to the colonies, a lot of aid. Um, and there, I'll, I'll give you examples as we go through this, um, through this talk. Um, they saw an opportunity to weaken uh, Britain uh, by supporting the revolution. And early on, uh, they, be, they came to believe that there's a possibility that these uh, rebellious uh, Brits uh, would succeed. They had some doubts. There's no question of that. And Saratoga kind of turned uh, some minds, but uh, they still, uh, you know, with Saratoga uh, didn't play their cards yet. Um, so they supported uh, uh, the colonies. And this gets to something that I need to say right off the front here, um, right off the bat, is that Spain contributed more money and supplies than any other country. And we'll, you know, you, you, you kind of shock some people, well, what about France? We sent soldiers, yes, they did. And France went broke as a result. Part of what France did was supported by Spanish money, actually. And so for example, the, the colonial army got Spanish arms uh, that the Spanish government paid for, uh, but they were sent from France. And so we come off, uh, you know, thinking that, oh, France sent those arms and contributed them. Uh, it wasn't the case. It was money paid by uh, Spain to do that. So that's just one example. Um, and so they were supporting the rebellion. Uh, people like Robert Morris, uh, who was, uh, you know, Minister of Finance uh, uh, later on in the war, but still involved in the Continental Congress and overseeing the, uh, the uh, Continental Navy and so forth and involved with the Continental Finances, uh, was doing business and, and soliciting aid. Um, he contacted the governor of Louis, Louisiana at the time, uh, Luis Gonzaga, uh, and then sent the, the good ship Rattletrap down the Mississippi uh, uh, to uh, collect uh, gunpowder and supplies uh, and um, ship it back up to Fort Pitt through St. Louis, Spanish St. Louis, uh, where George Rogers Clark was being supplied by Spanish arms and, and uh, armaments. Uh, George Rogers Clark, incidentally, made a couple of trips to Spanish St. Louis, where uh, he was feeded by the uh, lieutenant governor, the Spanish lieutenant governor, a guy named Leyva. Um, and um, so all this, this, this uh, smuggling of, of goods and arms are, are getting to the, uh, the colonial uh, cause from Spain. 
Um, and because they were neutral, they, you know, they, they, they use that neutrality to protect the, the covert aid because neutral ships make uh, for uh, you know uh, neutral aid and so uh, they weren't supposed to be attacked by the British because they hadn't they're not in war with the British so the British had to let them go even though the British knew it was going on and complained um, and Spain you know uh, just pled ignorance so we don't know what's going on uh, a lot of the aid most of the aid was filtered through Havana Cuba to um, to New Orleans or then up the coast to break the, the British pl uh, uh, blockade that was going on but it wasn't, you know, the war seemed to be going on and not, uh, there wasn't, uh, didn't seem to be an end to it. So finally, um, uh, Louis XVI and his advisors, uh, including the Minister of State, Virjan, um, uh, decided they need to get involved in the war and, and bring it to some kind of conclusion. It's kind of like what we think right now, what's going on with, with uh, in Eastern Europe right now with Russia. Why don't we get involved and just fight them with, rather than do something else to, to make, punish them? And so Spain say, now we're gonna we're gonna help the colonies and send aid and and uh, and we get it that way. Whereas now France, the excited country, the young king wants to go to war, and they came up with an idea that uh, they're gonna send their fleet uh, out to um, to the the colonies to to New York, and while the fleet's at sea, uh, they will use uh, some made up cause. Uh, to declare a war on Great Britain, uh, but before the fleet, the, the Spanish or the British fleet in New York hears that war has been declared, the French fleet will show up and surprise them and capture them, just like that. And we, with that fleet, with the, with the British fleet uh, defeated and captured in, in the colonies, uh, its army is exposed and, and peace will be brought and the colonies will be independent. Well, it was a great idea. They, they, uh, they shared the idea with uh, Aranda and, and Flor de Blanca and then to the king of Spain. Um, you know, they hesitatingly give them, gave them their blessing to go ahead and do it, and it failed. Uh, we know that, you know, the, the, the French fleet never did capture the, the British fleet. And so then now France is in, in France through two treaties that it signed with the, with the colonies in February of 1778 uh, was at war with uh, Great Britain. The second of those two treaties is interesting because it had a secret clause attached to it that the, uh, our founding fathers agreed to with France uh, that Spain, if it uh, declared war on Great Britain, would be an equal partner. And so that peace couldn't be uh, signed without the acquiescence of Spain or France or the colonies, they all had, in other words, they all had to agree. Each one had veto power over any, any uh, peace uh, uh, agreement. And so th that was an enticement for Spain to get involved in the war because once the uh, French fleet failed to surprise the British fleet, uh, Fran France knew that it couldn't defeat Great Britain by itself. And um, that's evident through all kinds of uh, primary source materials, <clears throat> not the least of which is the, uh, the Verjean, the prime, the uh, minister of state uh, to Louis the sixth, sixteenth, writing to him saying, "Pray, sire, that Spain joins us, or we are lost." Those, that's an exact quote. Uh, and what does that mean? If France can't win the war, the colonies aren't going to win the war. And so now France and the colonies are turning to to Spain, uh, you know, to get in the war. Florida de Blanca with his policy of patience has a couple of things going on. One is Spain is indeed preparing for war uh, and is preparing for war in a number of ways. It's building up its forces. It's saving its, its, uh, its powder, if you will, uh, which is you know, an old, an old uh, uh, phrase to you know, save your powder until the right moment. Well, actually what they're doing is building up their economy to go to war. They're not gonna, they're not gonna rush into a war unprepared again. So they're building their fleets and, and their armies and, and that. The other thing they're doing is they need to, to arrange things in Europe because there is this thing called the League of Armed Neutrality. They don't want Europe to break out in a big war uh, and, and end up on the losing end too. And, um, the, and one way to do that is to kind of cut off Britain from any, uh, any of the allies. And so, for example, when the Hessian troops uh, recruited by Britain uh, went to the colonies, it was you know, Spain that uh, made, uh, through diplomatic channels, uh, started cutting that off. So and more of them couldn't be uh, recruited by, by Britain. On the other side, uh, Portugal was a big ally with, um, with Great Britain. 
And uh, they had their prime minister, who was kind of like a, a semi-dictator in Portugal at the time, a guy named Pumbal. Um, and so um, Spain needed to get Portugal to be neutral. And one of the ways they did that, uh, they used the excuse of uh, Portuguese and Spanish illicit trade and settlements along the, uh, the uh, Rio de la Plata, opposite Buenos Aires, which is today Argentina, in South America of all places. So the largest fleet of ships in the whole war, even though that Spain wasn't at war, uh, took place when Spain sent a fleet of 14 ships of the line and some 20,000 soldiers um, and a bunch of frigates and troop, carrier, uh, troop carriers, probably something like around 40 ships to South America uh, to usurp the British and Portuguese uh, from the coast there and in the Rio de la Plata, which they successfully did. And so now Florida de Blanca is waiting for that fleet to return before he's going to declare war, because that's a major resource if you're going to war. At the same time they sent that fleet south, they sent another fleet to Lisbon, where it anchored opposite the, uh, the capital there, Lisbon and Portugal, with guns trained on, on, on Lisbon and forced Pombal to declare neutrality. Actually, that act actually forced, eventually forced Pumbal out of office and Portugal signed a treaty of uh, amnesty with uh, Spain. So they became a neutral country and wouldn't get involved. Spain was doing all of this while it was negotiating or negotiating with Britain and, and sending supplies and money to the colonies through France and directly. And we're gonna get to more of that too. So all this is going on. So finally, uh, Florida gave an ultimatum to Florida de Blanca gave an ultimatum to to Great Britain. Uh, you know, um, you know, uh, we don't want to go to war, but if we do, it's going to tip the scales in the favor of, of us, and you're going to lose your colonies anyways. Um, you know, uh, grant the independence to the colonies and let's end the war. Um, and of course, he asked for for Gibraltar as well. I mean, he had something that he wanted. And of course, Great Britain and its obstinacy wasn't about to give up its, uh, its uh, you know, Gibraltar as it never has. Uh, and so uh, finally, in, um, Spain in June of, uh, of uh, 1779, June 21st, if you need the exact date, declared war on Great Britain. Now, this is one of the reasons why we historians in the United States don't give uh, Spain too much credit. Two of the reasons, actually. One, they came in after France, but we tend to overlook that they almost negotiated a peace. There was, you know, in the parliament, a, a division about this. Um, and uh, two, they declared war on Britain, but uh, didn't uh, sign a treaty with the colonies. Well, that was an effect done by that earlier treaty with France and the colonies that had that secret uh, clause. So they declare war. And uh, with war, uh, we have some interesting things going on. Spain lists to France exactly what it wants to do. And what it wants, what's, what it wants out of the war, uh, you know, for, for, you know, they're not going to negotiate the independence of the colonies. That's, that was clear. But they want uh, Fr uh, Britain out of Florida. They want Britain out of the Mississippi River. Um, they want Jamaica. They want Britain out of Central America. They want Gibraltar and they want Menorca, the island of Menorca. You know, and of course, France called those Spain's gigantic demands. Uh, Gibraltar became a key in all of this. And in some, you know, a, a historian could argue that because of um, Britain's stubbornness about Gibraltar, it, it allowed the 13 colonies to become independent. It lost the 13 colonies. What happened with Gibraltar, besides it wouldn't negotiate it away, was a 22,000 man army, French and Spanish army, laid siege on Gibraltar and kept that siege up through the duration of the war. This meant that um, the poor people that were trapped there in Gibraltar uh, had, to, had to get aid uh, from, from Britain. So Britain twice sent big fleets to Gibraltar uh, to help uh, relieve uh, uh, the people there and lift the siege. They never did lift the siege. They were able to get supplies. But each time that Britain sent its fleet to Gibraltar, uh, France and or Spain sent its fleets to the Americas. So the soldiers that ended up fighting with George Washington, for example, were shipped from France 
while, Spain, while Britain was otherwise distracted by Gibraltar and couldn't attack the Armada transporting the fleet. So it was like a big international chess game. The, um, this, one of the great battles that took place in the second attempt at uh, Britain's uh, um, uh, uh, lifting the siege in Gibraltar was uh, a battle between the guy, not this guy, but another guy named Langara, comes down to us as General Langara, uh, supposedly an, an aged uh, um, sailor, you know, an ancient mariner, if you will, um, who was ordered to go out and intercept uh, Rodney's fleet uh, from Britain. He went out with an inferior fleet uh, to attack a, a superior British fleet that was heading to Gibraltar. And he engaged that uh, British fleet. He lost. Uh, in fact, he was captured. He refused to surrender. And they finally had to capture him off his flagship that was completely demasted um, and, um, and taken to Britain. Uh, but in the, in the, as a result of that, as the King of Spain uh, wrote, um, they made Britain dearly pay for its victory. Uh, you know, if you're a soldier or a veteran, you know what that means. Um, and um, Rodney, the remnants of Rodney's fleet, he lost about a lot of ships in that in that battle. And then a storm uh, did damage on some of the other ones that were uh, partially uh, uh, destroyed. Um, he was unable to lift the siege. And while that was going on, Spain under the, the um, uh, go back one, Carl, to the, the sailor dude. Nope, up one, I guess. There we go. Okay, this guy, Solano, uh, good old Jose Solano y Bote. Um, Jose Solano y Bote um, uh, was the guy that took, took 14,000 men to Havana. Uh, this is gonna be important too. And he got them there without uh, fear because Britain was distracted by Gibraltar with that other battle. Now, the previous one that you saw is Langara. You can show that again so everybody can look at the hero who, who sacrificed himself. Um, there he is. Um, it's him in a younger state. He was an older man when the battle took place, but that's okay. Um, so he, he's, he should be an American hero, too, in his own right. So let's go back to Solano now. Um, Solano gets, you know, I even in, in my book, I have his illustration in there. So he gets more credit uh, than Langara when Langara really should get more credit. Uh, Solano got the troops there, but then we'll see that Solano did nothing much else and uh, became somewhat of a handicap to, uh, to the Spanish uh, forces. Um, with all the troops in Havana then, uh, Spain also sent a new governor uh, to New Orleans, and that was uh, Bernardo Mera y Pacheco. And uh, Bernardo Mera y Pacheco, go ahead, Bernardo Mera y Pacheco. Um, um, what am I saying? Bernardo de Galvez. I'm thinking of a different guy. Bernardo de Galvez um, was the nephew of Jose de Galvez, the Minister of State. And he was assigned to New Orleans. And then he was told to prepare for war in New Orleans, uh, and which he was doing. And he, was, uh, he, he had an interesting life there. He married a local Creole um, a French woman from a very, one of the wealthier French families there that had become now subjects of Spain because New Orleans was Spanish. Uh, in fact, his father-in-law became a spy for him, went to uh, Mobile and then over to Pensacola and came back with reports of all the fortifications there and everything for him. Um, Bernardo de Galvez is assigned there. Um, he, you know, when war broke out, finally, he had the whole big strategy. He wasn't going to be, you know, just, you know, wait for the British to attack him. His, his idea wasn't to be defensive. His idea was the best defense is an offense. And so he attacked the British uh, fortifications in the, uh, in the cover illustration of this whole lecture that you saw in the advertisements is a, is a romantic variation of, of him leading his troops through the swamps overland to surprise the British uh, forts. He defeated the British in Natchez and, and Manchuk, uh, Baton Rouge, Baton Rouge, um, you know, and then successfully was going to could defend New Orleans but then he um, sent forces over to Mobile Alabama where he defeated the British again with all that success 
Um, he then wanted to attack Pensacola, but he couldn't do it from New Orleans. He didn't have the resources. He needed Havana to kick in. And Havana was hesitant to do it because Havana in the previous war had been uh, attacked and taken by Great Britain. Part of the negotiations for the end of that war is for Spain to get back Havana and Cuba, uh, whereas uh, Britain for some reason, uh, I guess wanted to keep Jamaica and, and uh, not worry about uh, negotiating anything with uh, Canada or anything. So the people in Havana were very leery of giving up anything uh, uh, that would uh, impede their defense during this war. Um, and this ran afoul of what Galvez wanted to do. Um, and before we, you know, I want to switch from Galvez now to his father. We don't have an illustration of him, so don't do anything, uh, yeah, Carl. Um, his father was Matias de Galvez. Now, you remember uh, back when I started the whole concern about the, the canal and Central America and everything, um, Spain had been watching the British activities there. And when war was declared, Britain overtly then tried to take Central America, which in, they called Guatemala at that time, all of Central America. And so Matias de Galvez was made, uh, the, the father of Bernardo and the brother of Jose was made the commanding general of all the Spanish forces and militia in Guatemala. So he was charged now of defending that area and usurping the British. Probably the most vicious fighting of the whole war, you know, from New England on down, took place in Central America uh, for a lot of reasons. The heat, the uh, topography, the conditions, um, and just the viciousness of it all, and the involvement of the Native Americans in Central America. And so almost reminiscent of, um, you know, Vietnam or something where you went into jungles and reconnaissance and were ambushed, and then you did fire and burn uh, techniques. This went on where Spanish soldiers would go in, in, in up the Rio Tinto River and come out six months later, different people all together. The big battle finally took place on the real Nicaragua, uh, where um, the, the, the British forces were progressing upriver. They were met by um, a, a Spanish force, an undermanned Spanish force that pretty much sacrificed itself. I think something like eight or 12 of them managed to escape the battle in the end, uh, but they slowed down the, the, uh, the, the British force long enough for the uh, defenses to be put up at the mouth of the river at the at Nicaragua Lake there. And, uh, and so when the British forces finally got there after going up river fighting the battle and all the heat and humidity and everything else that goes on in the, in the tropics, um, they, uh, they found a, you know, a rejuvenated Spanish force waiting for them and were defeated and had to, had to retreat. What, what was left of them had to retreat. And so the British were defeated in Central America. All that is going on while, you know, George Washington and, and all our founding fathers are fighting the British soldiers in the 13 colonies. And it's a big part of why, the, you know, the 13 colonies are going to get their independence. Meanwhile, back in Havana, uh, 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 Matias de Galvez's son, Bernardo, the governor of, of New Orleans, um, go, went to Havana and finally, uh, because he has the connections with his uncle, the minister of state, um, uh, he convinced the hesitant governor there to, to form an expedition to attack Pensacola, and they set sail. Unfortunately, as we know, uh, happens there often enough, um, a tropical storm hit them and destroyed the expedition. Um, ships were, were sunk and scattered all over the Gulf of Mexico. Some of the survivors were picked up in, in Florida, in, the, in the, um, the west coast of Florida, and others in the Yucatan Peninsula. Um, and uh, those that survived, you know, uh, limped back into Havana. The whole thing was, was ruined. Uh, and so the governor there said, that's it. We're not going to do that again. Um, I told you so, kind of says that to, to Bernardo. But Bernardo, being this kind of headstrong guy with the connection said, no, we got to reorganize and reform. Uh, the governor said, no, I, we lost enough with this, this, uh, this escapade of yours. We're not going to do it anymore. Word gets back to Spain. Um, and uh, so then uh, the king uh, grants that uh, somebody should be sent to, 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 make, to make sure his word has prevailed. And Jose de Galvez has a person that's just perfect for that. And that man is Francisco Saavedra. And there he is. 
Francisco Saavedra is probably the most unsung hero of, the, of this whole um, history. Francisco Saavedra, a well-educated, enlightened man, man of letters, uh, spoke uh, French, uh, studied Arabic, uh, spoke English, actually translated uh, some English uh, to Spanish, um, and uh, was interested in, in medicine, although he was not a doctor. Um, he just an enlightened man um, and a an historical preservationist. I know the Park Service will like that. Um, he was always everywhere he went. He would look at old buildings and look for old, uh, old uh, evidence of uh, previous civilizations and, and then write down in his notes his observations and stuff. Just, just a brilliant man. Um, and uh, he endeared himself, uh, one of these people who wasn't a blue blood, he had no title or anything, but he was so educated and so smart, he moved up the ranks, he became friends, he fought in the battles of, uh, in uh, Spanish battle in Algiers, um, Spanish forces, uh, was slightly wounded there, and uh, became a hero for saving almost 200 lives. Um, Spanish lives in that battle, uh, where he, um, and because of that battle, he became friends of Bernardo de Galvez, the, the governor of New Orleans, who's trying to get uh, forced together in, in Havana. And Bernardo de Galvez recommended him to his, his uh, uncle, Jose. And so he became connected with the Galvez family. And Jose de Galvez um, convinced the king that Saavedra was the perfect person to send as the king's representative to Havana uh, to get things going. And so Saavedra went to Havana met with the governor there and his assistants and kind of explained to him in no uncertain terms, although Saavedra is an interesting guy. He, he, he wasn't a bully. Um, he was kind of this, this uh, you know, intelligent, elegant type of person. And he talks in his notes how he talked to each of these guys before he forced the, uh, the Junta del Guerra, as he called it, the War Council, um, and told him what the king's position was and what had to be done and how can we do this without uh, ruffling everybody's feathers. And he finally convinced everybody that it had to be done, um, but that they needed money. They were in the money came from uh, New Spain, from Mexico, and, and, and Mexico was uh, derelict in, in sending the money to Havana. And so what's going on there? Uh, and uh, so he had to try to figure that one out, too. Well, they, they, kind of, they got it together, and uh, he wrote some letters to the, the viceroy in, in, um, in Mexico uh, to tell him that uh, on behalf of the king, he was requesting that he get this uh, done more, you know, get the money sent more efficiently. Some of it did come. They formed a new armada. Um, Saavedra uh, told Galvez that he should lead the armada. Then there was a, 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 a kind of a, a disruption because the military men in in Havana, especially the naval officers, uh, refused to be put under the command of Bernardo de Galvez, who was an army officer. Um, that goes on today, you know, uh, Navy and Air Force and Army people hate to be put under each other. They, they want their own in charge. And um, so there's this whole debate of who's going to command the, um, the attack on Pensacola. And it, they, they it, they left it to, to Saavedra to solve the problem, and, and as Saavedra did, he, he, he met with the naval commander and secured the agreement that so, so long as, uh, you know, uh, when you depart the port, you are in charge, you know, when you set sail, you are in charge, and you are in charge to, to get them there, in charge of the transport. Once there, then Galvez will be in charge of the siege, and so they agreed to that. The naval commander was a little bit upset about it. I mean, he wasn't in charge of the whole attack then, but uh, that's the way it was going to be. And so they they went, uh, um, they set sail for Pensacola, and now we'll show you a map of Pensacola, which will show you kind of the problems. Um, Pensacola, as you can see, is on the backside of the entry there. And actually, that entry is a little, uh, the, uh, a little closer together than it shows on the map in reality, but that's OK. Um, and so the, the British had uh, uh, fortresses on either side of that entry. So if you had to go through, you, you ran the gauntlet if, if, if you wanted to get through. Um, the town, you can see there in the little dots and stuff, but right in the middle of the town, you can see a, um, a British fortress, that little kind of thicker square thing. Um, and so all of that, you know, uh, you know that, that's, that's a pretty difficult place to, to attack. When the fleet got up to the face of that place, you know, they, they looked at it, the naval, the, the, the commander looked at that and said, uh, 
we can't get through. And he was right. They did, you know, the, the big ships can't get through. Um, we can't do that. We're not going to do that. And um, Galva says, yeah, but the, the, the frigates and the other ships can get through. Let's go. And um, the naval commander at that point said, nope, I'm not doing it. So Galvez had a ship there that was his own. It was a, a schooner that uh, he'd, uh, his, uh, the Americans in New Orleans had given him after they'd captured it from the British. Um, and uh, he, call, he called it the, uh, you know, he, he, he called it the Galveston, you know, his own ship. And his brother-in-law and him, he, he, who was with him, uh, uh, asked for volunteers. They boarded the ship and they set sail. Uh, you know, he raised his flag and, and shot his cannon to let the, uh, the naval commander know we're going in. Um, it, just to show you, and the naval, the naval commander was so irritated, uh, he, um, he, he um, threatened uh, to have uh, Galvez arrested and, and executed for his, his, uh, his uh, lack of discipline in the matter. Well, he couldn't stop uh, Galvez, who had already set sail, and then the stories, you know, of them going through the gauntlet and the, the British cannons firing off, and of course, uh, those cannons and firearms in those days let off a lot of smoke, and all they could hear was the thunder and, and the booming of all the cannons, and the smoke just settled over the ship, and, uh, you know, and then all of a sudden, things were quiet, and uh, the sailors on the ship, and says, boy, that, those guys were... <laughs> You know, they got, you know, they're dead, you know, they poor people. And yeah, well, they were stupid too and all of this. And then the, the smoke kind of lifted up and the other side in the bay was the schooner with Galvez. They'd made it through. And because they made it through, that embarrassed the rest of the fleet uh, and ship transports to go in. And so they, they landed on the peninsula on the right side. They took the fort there. They went into the bay um, and they started the siege of Pensacola, which lasted a couple of months. Um, that siege uh, involved all the all the techniques. If you're a military historian, I won't go into detail, but yeah, they had to dig uh, their trenches and their rabouts, and and they had to deal with uh, the Indian allies of the British uh, who uh, would attack them. There was some fierce uh, artillery exchanges. Then there was also some fierce hand-to-hand -hand bayonet and, and sword fighting. Um, and finally, uh, at, one, at one point, even uh, Galvez was wounded. A uh, bullet creased his stomach and hit his left arm. Uh, and he uh, was placed in a hospital for uh, about a week. Um, and um, he was in, a, in the hospital when Saavedra showed up with promised uh, um, uh, reinforcements from, from the uh, French uh, side. You know, they got from the Cabo uh, Frances uh, soldiers came in um, at Saavedra's request. And, and uh, so he showed up with reinforcements and went to see his friend uh, Bernardo, who was laid up with his wounds. Well, Bernardo soon got out of bed. And you can see in this illustration, which is contemporary to the time, this isn't uh, some, uh, you know, uh, 20th century or 21st century artist rendition. This is an 18th uh, century rendition. Uh, one of the artillery barrages hit the ammo dump in the British fort and blew it up. And if you look closely, you can see uh, bodies flying in the, in the explosion, which is exactly how it's described, body parts and bodies. And it breached the uh, fortress and the, uh, in the romantic drawing here uh, on the side, um, uh, Spanish forces charged in and uh, took the fort and uh, the British surrendered. Uh, and so Pensacola was taken. This was a major blow to Britain. This was the first big loss to them uh, from, from forces other than the colonial forces. Um, in, well, a second one, I want to say, because the, the, the Guatemala thing took place like a month before this one. So, you know, Britain is, is, uh, having, having, is, is now forced to make some decisions. And this gets to the whole strategy of the war. You know, our founding fathers didn't set the strategy for the, for the Revolutionary War. It was set in Europe. And the country that did that was Spain, because Spain was the one that, that, that tipped the balance. And so when Spain said, this is what we want and the things that I listed, they also said, here's how we're going to do it. We're going to make Great Britain make some hard decisions. Do they want to save their West Indy trade? or those cold harbors up north? What's more important to Britain? Gibraltar or Boston? Menorca or Philadelphia? India, incidentally, their colonies in India or Central America? 
What's more important? We will spread the British lion out and make it make its decisions. And so like an international chess game, you can see this all happening with fighting in Central America. French fleet went to India that, that Spanish, you know, suggested uh, to fight the British there. Meanwhile, in Europe, the siege of Gibraltar is going on um, and a Spanish um, um, armada and group and soldiers attacked Menorca and defeated the British in the island, Mediterranean island of Menorca. And that was, that was another siege of another fort. And so all this is going on. And then the ultimate threat, of course, is an invasion of England itself, which uh, never happened, but Spain and France used that threat to divert the British attention away from the war in America. Spain's priority, of course, was America, not 13 colonies, but its own. Um, that's why they were happy uh, to defeat the British at uh, Pensacola and then in Central America, especially Central America. They wanted to protect uh, Mexico. So after this fight, um, Spanish soldiers under Bernardo de Galvez go on to defeat the British and take uh, the Bahama Islands from Britain. Uh, they also defeated them uh, in Mobile, Alabama, uh, which took place before Pensacola, incidentally. Uh, and, they, and they defeated them in Central America, extracting them from the, the Mosquito Coast and then the, the Rio de San Juan de Nicaragua. So all this is going on and it all plays into what's going on. While this is going on, the ultimate goal of Spanish strategy in America was to take Gibraltar. And that was one of the main reasons that Saavedra was sent there to organize. The guy was so smart and such a tactician, uh, the king let, left it up to Saavedra to organize the siege of British um, Jamaica, Kingston, Jamaica being the capital. This is the heart of British West Indy trade. And uh, this is what they really wanted to do is to hurt Britain and get them out of America completely, just completely extract them. Um, and so, uh, so Vader was there to do that. And he had to coordinate it with um, the French and the Frenchman, that uh, the French officer that he had to deal that was the, the Admiral of the Navy, uh, de Grasse. And there he is. And de Grasse came to respect Saavedra so much that he wrote to the uh, to Virjan, the Minister of State, uh, that he should be treated as if he were I. Um, he so admired Saavedra and what Saavedra was doing. So they, Saavedra actually went to the French Capes to meet with, with de Grasse and talk about how they're going to coordinate their forces and that there's going to be a fleet coming in from Europe, uh, two fleets coming in from Europe, a French and Spanish fleet, to supplement what they have in the Caribbean at the time uh, to attack Jamaica. And they have to do it at a certain time of the season. They don't want to get caught in any more hurricanes. Uh, they learn their lesson that way. Um, meanwhile, word comes to them that uh, the British forces have moved south into Virginia and the, and the British Navy uh, has left them exposed. Well, this was a big key. I mean, the whole, the whole reason George Washington couldn't defeat the British Army is because the British Navy kept, kept rescuing the British Army. The British Army could on and offload the, 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 the British Navy at will and travel that way, where George Washington and, and his troops had to go overland, which was really miserable. Yeah, and I think all, the, all the, um, the rangers know about that, you know, moving through, the, through you know, moving trees and rocks and mud and, and snow and ice and everything else, depending on the season. It was just you know, miserable. The roads were awful if there were any that they had to go on. And so the British had that, that the advantage of the Navy. And the whole idea was is to separate the Navy um, from, from the Army, which was the original idea of, uh, of the uh, French surprise that failed. And so all of a sudden, here's Lord Cornwallis uh, south uh, in now Yorktown uh, with no Navy to support him. So what do they decide to do? First of all, uh, word gets back to Spain that this is going on and Spain and France decide, well, we're going to fake a, uh, an invasion of, of Britain to distract that Navy, to slow them down if they're going to come and rescue this guy. The second thing is uh, we need, we need, you know, we need for, for the French and, and, um, and, uh, and American troops to attack Cornwallis at Yorktown. But George Washington and uh, Rochambeau were up in New York and they had a problem. They needed to pay their soldiers. 
And uh, I mean, we know from our own history that, uh, you know, George had trouble keeping his soldiers intact. You know, they take on these six month stints and then they have to go back to the farms or if they weren't getting paid or treated right. And he was having trouble with desertions and everything else. Um, and so how are we going to do this? It was left up to Saavedra again. Saavedra came up with the idea of says, Spain and France will pay for it. De Grasse, you need to sail with your fleet north. Forget Jamaica. It's getting late in the season. The opportunity is now. If we can end the war with Yorktown, let's do it. And De Grasse says, well, who's going to pay for my sailors and my fleet? You know, the money to pay for us. And incidentally, Spain was paying for French uh, presence in the Caribbean at the time through its money in Mexico. The money to pay for us hasn't even arrived. That was the fleet coming from Mexico. So all, you know, here's Saavedra saying, we need to do this. Time is, you know, now's the time. We need to cast the dice, if you will. And so he said, I'll tell you what, let's take up a collection. De Grassi agreed, tried to take up a collection there at the French colony in, in, in Cape Francois. Um, and it was an, an embarrassment. Uh, it, they didn't collect much of anything. And Saavedra, not to be uh, uh, discouraged, said, to De Grasse, give me your fastest frigate and let me sail to Havana. I will collect the money. Meanwhile, you settle north and wait for me at a certain point and the money will show up for you. And Saavedra, and I just love it because Saavedra was this good looking guy and everything. I can just see him sailing on this fast frigate, you know, making wake, uh, going to Havana. And he gets to Havana um, and uh, he goes to the governor in Havana at the time and says, we need to raise money. Um, you know, what's in the till? And the guy says, well, the fleet, the treasure fleet from Mexico hasn't showed up yet. And he says, what's, what, when's it due? And he says, well, any day, but it hasn't showed up. And we can't wait. Saavedra replies, says, we need to collect the money. And uh, the, uh, the uh, financial um, officer of the governor came, came up with the idea and says, let's take out loans. Let's collect it here. And so they rang the church bells, uh, announcing that they were going to go around, that the opportunity to win the war was now, but they needed the money to be paid back uh, when the treasure fleet uh, shows up. And... Um, and they sent out, incidentally, uh, French officers from that frigate that, uh, that had transported uh, Saavedra to collect the money. And in the course of one afternoon, they collected two and a half million dollars uh, from the merchants of Havana. Now, understand, Havana was probably the richest city in the Americas at that time. Uh, probably even more, well, I mean, not more so than Mexico City because they were mining silver there and they needed that silver to pay for this in the end. Um, but as a merchant city, uh, in the West Indies, it was the richest city. So all these rich merchants and stuff um, contributed this money. And then, of course, Saavedra gave it to the French and, they, and that French frigate uh, sailed uh, and met de Grassi. And with that money, de Grassi sailed north. And there are documents even in our own archives um, there were de Grassi even, uh, you know, talks about having arrived with the money uh, to pay for the battle. And of course, the word of the money going up went up to... And George Washington and, and the French uh, allies, and they marched south on, on that promise. And of course, the rest is history. Uh, Yorktown became the battle that uh, basically uh, turned the tide and would grant uh, independence of the United States. Um, how much money is, is uh, subject to some, some uh, not debate, but uh, interest, because we haven't quite nailed down all the money. Um, not only did he raise that two and a half million dollars, but then all of a sudden, uh, the treasure fleet showed up uh, just after that, and Bernardo de Galvez, who was in Havana, who showed up in Havana right after that, uh, right when the, the treasure fleet showed up, ordered that another uh, $2 million be sent north to help with the battle. So um, money, you know, the irony of all of this is, is that money from Spain and Mexico paid for the Battle of Yorktown. Um, you know, to talk about international financing. Um, and, um, and uh, of course, a legend grew out of it that the women of Havana sold their jewelry uh, to raise the money for the Battle of Yorktown. That's basically a legend. Um, people were paid back for their loans, but uh, granted at the time, uh, you know, um, that was pretty risky business to do, but they did it and they did it without hesitation. So that's, that's how uh, Yorktown was taken. All right, so now we're getting to the end of the war. Um, Francisco Saavedra, incidentally, um, to make sure that the, everybody was paid back, was sent uh, from Havana to Mexico City to um, sit down with the viceroy there and make sure that he uh, yeah, was more expedient uh, with his payments. 
so he succeeded in doing that. And we won't get into the rest of his life, which is really interesting. Um, so there we have the, the story basically of the revolution as a result of all of that and Spain's involvement in the revolution, uh, you know, independence is granted to the United States. The negotiations go on in Paris and who's in, involved in the in negotiations. Of course, we know from our side, there's Benjamin Franklin, um, you know, and, and, uh, and, uh, and Aranda is, is representing Spain. Um, and then the British are, are represented to John Jay um, uh, moved up from from was sent to to uh, to who was sent originally to Madrid was transferred to Paris to participate in the negotiations. So if you look at the uh, treaty that granted us our independence in 1783, you'll see the signature of the Conde de Aranda right there, right by Benjamin Franklin's and, and our our founding uh, representatives. Um, and that gets us to, you know, kind of the finances a little bit. And I want to talk about how did I get, we still don't know exactly how much Spain gave because it's, it's kind of nebulous. Uh, so for example, at one point, um, uh, there's a shipment of, uh, from, from a firm of Gardoki Hijos, a banking firm, and Diego Gardoki um, was a Spanish agent uh, and merchant. Uh, he had a, a big banking firm that he inherited from his dad, had been trading with the colonies illicitly uh, from the colonial point of view because Britain wouldn't allow it. But he, a Spanish, a northern a Spanish firm, had been trading with the colonies at least from 1765. Before Spain got in the war, even, uh, in some of that illicit aid, his firm sent one shipment that we do know of, 18,000 blankets, 11,000 pairs of shoes, 41,000 pairs of stockings and shirts and, and medical supplies. Um, this is before the Spain's declaration of war. This is covert aid. And so that kind of stuff was going on. At the same time, when we talked about, uh, you know, aid going through, we can count for one shipment of supplies, gunpowder and weapons that amounted to basically $70,000 that went up the Mississippi River uh, that was Spanish aid to, to, the, to the colonies. We know that blankets made it through New Orleans all the way to Valley Forge. Um, and it's an interesting story because they arrived and uh, Patrick Henry, whom the Spanish called Patricio Enrique, uh, I love when I have some Spanish speakers in the audience to ask them who Patricio Enrique was and none of them ever figure it out for some reason. It's so obvious, Patricio Enrique is Patrick Henry. Uh, you know, they, they uh, you know, he represented the colony of Virginia. And so when those blankets got there, he claimed all the blankets for the Virginia troops. He said that was our order. That was done on us because Oliver Pollock, our agent in New Orleans, arranged for that. And uh, I didn't get into Oliver Pollock because we're going to be running out of time here. But uh, so, he, you know, there, there was some stinginess going on, even at Valley Forge. It's kind of interesting. It gives you an idea of what uh, Washington had to deal with. Uh, in that that uh, at that time, so those things were going on. We also know that um, the Spanish Church contributed uh, to the war. Now, and this is really interesting. The king asked the church uh, to to contribute, and we're going to get to this guy in a second, but leave him there. Um, and uh, you know, one of the original ways that that happened, one of the unique ways that it happened, was when Spain started collecting a tax. Uh, for for supporting this war, what they did, they sent out this thing to everybody, including in the Americas, and made it all the way to New Mexico, where I first uh, came a, a aware of it, uh, where each Spanish uh, subject uh, had to pay two pesos each, and each non-subject, where Indian or otherwise, had to pay one peso each. In California, um, this guy here, Junipero Serra, the, the uh, founding Franciscan of the missions of California, uh, didn't want to burden the Indians with having to pay a peso or the equivalent of that in some kind of goods or stuff, uh, took it out of the missions tills uh, to pay it. Uh, and then uh, there's a, a sermon he gave, a uh, record of which has been kept there, where he asked the, his uh, followers, uh, his, uh, his neophytes, to, to pray for the success of one George Washington. And this is in California. And so in, in the, um, I'm trying to look up here where I, I, I put the number of, uh, oh, here, that uh, California came up. They, here it is. California collected a total of 4,216 pesos that they sent back to Spain to support the war. Um, that's kind of an equivalency. And this is part of the other thing why we can't nail it exactly. How do you, you 
do an equal thing from then to now and pesos to dollars and everything else when there was no dollar in the colonies at the time, but roughly $420,000 uh, from the, the missions in, in uh, small colonies of California. In New Mexico, 3,677 pesos. Now the peso part we have from documents, uh, that was clipped, that'd be around 110,000 um, doing that. And then uh, Arizona, which was basically Tucson South, there was no Phoenix or anything, um, collected 22,420 pesos or 420,000 more or less uh, that went to this. And so all that money, you know, we, we still don't know where, you know, what came from some of the other colonies. Texas is, um, claims that, it, that it, the, you know, we don't have an amount for Texas, but there probably was. We do know they sent a herd of cattle to help feed the Spanish uh, troops in, in Louisiana. Uh, so we know that. And incidentally, a battle was fought in St. Louis and Britain, uh, British forces attacked St. Louis and were defeated. Um, and before that, an expedition from St. Louis went as far north as southern Michigan, a Spanish expedition during the winter. They left in, in late January and arrived at Fort St. Joseph, which is in southern Michigan, and uh, sacked and burned it down um, in February. So if any of you people are from that area of the country, you know what that's like in the winter. And they talk about having to cache their goods at a, at a certain point of the river because it couldn't go further north and it frozen and they were walking through snow and, and stuff to get there. And so all this, you know, think about this, that Spain was, was confronting Britain from Michigan uh, to South America, in the Mediterranean, uh, and in Europe, in Gibraltar. So that, that was a world war. And then, of course, France going to, to India made it a world war. And in the context of that world war is where, where all this victory comes from. And finally, I want to get to the Spanish church in Spain and uh, you can bring up the next one. This is a photo I took. This is uh, Malaga, Spain today. I didn't take it today, but this is how it looks today. This is the cathedral in Malaga. And uh, those of you with discerning eye will notice that it has one tower and the other tower uh, doesn't look quite right. That's because it was never completed. And uh, there is a reason for that. The king of Spain asked the uh, cardinal in Toledo, this, the Catholic cardinal in Toledo, which is the head of the Spanish church, uh, to help support the war. And the Cardinal agreed to do that. So Toledo create, uh, contributed something like uh, $2 million worth of money, um, 100,000 uh, reales as it is. That's over 300, 3 million actually, if we tried loosely to do a comparison. So, but they also sent word out to all the other churches and the Cardinal being the mother church, you know, well, we got records of the, what happened in Malaga. One of the reasons I finally came to Malaga, I guess, because originally doing the research and then coming and speaking to the people here found that they're so receptive. You know, most people don't like me, you know. Um, and so <laughs> uh, this church was under construction and they were gonna finish the second tower when the, when the request came for money. Instead of spending the money on the tower, uh, the people decided to send it uh, to support the war. Now, the legend is, is that uh, they could never finish the tower because he supported the war. Uh, that's not quite true. They diverted the money at the time and they couldn't finish at the time, but they, they raised money subsequently to that, but used it for other priorities. Still, it is a, a visual uh, reminder uh, of uh, how Spain supported uh, the, the independence of the United States. Incidentally, just two weeks ago, the Daughters of American Revolution showed up here uh, to present a plaque to uh, Malaga for its support of our independence and uh, took pictures, of course, and posed in you know, the tower in the background and everything. Um, so uh, financing of the war uh, shows up in, in odd ways. Then there are memories. And this is one memory. Uh, there's the Galvez coat of arms. There it is. Uh, Galvez was recalled to Spain, where he received all the accolades and honors, and the king revised the uh, Galvez uh, coat of armor of honor, arms, uh, the escudo. And you can see in the lower right side, a big guy in a small ship. That's his ship. And the ship on the side says Galveston on it. There you go. And you can see the little bandana on the top says Yo Solo. That was awarded to him. 
to his name, Yo Solo, I alone, because of his his going into the port by himself, you know, on his own ship when the, the Navy uh, Admiral wouldn't do it. Yo Solo, nothing more honorable for a military man to have that, right? I did it alone, uh, Yo Solo. And incidentally, Galveston, Texas um, is named uh, for the good ship Galveston, uh, which harkens back then to the revolution and uh, the Battle of Pensacola. Uh, and so there, there is that. And then um, in 200 year anniversary, our anniversary, the King of Spain commissioned that a statue of Galvis uh, be uh, uh, executed and put up in front of the, the State Department in Washington, DC, of course, with the acquis uh, permission of the uh, United States government. So there, there's the, the former King of Spain, but the King of Spain at the time, Juan Carlos II, who is now in semi-exile and disgraced, uh, because of corruption that he got involved with uh, later in his career. Um, but there he is, and here's the statue that he commissioned. It's coming, sort of. Well, if you look closely at the statue and then at, uh, at the, uh, the king, you'll see that the king uh, looks uh, somewhat like Galvez does on the statue. So the, the artist uh, knew who was, who was buttering his bread. Um, and that you, you get good images of that, and you can see that uh, he used the king's face and everything to be Galvez in that statue. So one of the fun things, the statue is in, in front of the State Department building in Washington, D.C. Um, there is no photo of this. I didn't take it, but it, there is the, at the time, there was an arms factory in Seville, Spain, where they're making cannons and mortars and things. Um, they apparently made two mortars and had them, when they forged them, they had the names forged into the, into the mortars. Uh, one of them was George and the other one's Washington. Uh, the war ended before they could ship them out. So they are now at the front gate of that building that was the uh, arms factory. It's now used for other things, it's been renovated. But those two mortars, if you're ever in Sevilla, uh, look for them and there they are, George and Washington, two mortars with his name on them. Um, and then there's this guy, Juan de Morales, and I'm sure everybody at the uh, Philadelphia office knows about him. Uh, he was the, uh, the, the Spanish representative uh, to the, uh, the Colonial Congress uh, during the war. And because Spain was neutral, he wasn't officially recognized at all. And so anything he did, especially after France declared war, he did it through uh, his French counterpart, a guy named Girard, Alexander Girard. Um, and so we know now from continental papers, or we should have known before, but uh, apparently nobody bothered to, to read them or believe them, that he was informing the Continental Congress all the time of what Spain was doing and, and wanted to do and what its policy was. And so when Florida de Blanca, for example, was trying to negotiate a peace, our founding fathers knew that. They knew it. And uh, now that you know it, if you ever do any research, you'll start looking at the same documents and saying, oh, yeah, that's what that's about. Um, he he uh, passed away uh, during the war, and I see if I can find this real quick. Um, here we go. And he he be, he befriended uh, George Washington, um, spent time with George Washington. In fact, when he was visiting George Washington in, in uh, his headquarters in Morristown, um, um, Morales died, um, and um, George Washington then. Uh, oversaw his funeral. And uh, you have a description of his funeral by one of the soldiers there who described it, uh, and this is just partially, the honorary pallbearers were six field officers, meaning American field officers, and on the shoulders of four artillery officers in full uniform, the actual pallbearers, he was borne to the grave while mute guns were fired by the artillery. So George Washington gave this man, the Spanish representative, a full military funeral, a memorial mass, a high mass, uh, memorial mass was given in Philadelphia, and we have the place of that. There it is, St. Mary's, uh, which still exists, and um, George Washington and um, our colonial leaders and many of his officers attended that mass. And all this is an irony that, that Spanish church um, helped pay for the war, that George Washington would attend a mass and everything is a little bit of an irony because one of the reasons we listed 
uh, as a as a reason for rebellion was uh, the uh, the various acts. You know, the, and uh, one of those acts was the Quebec Act um, that uh, uh, the, that Britain allowed the uh, French Catholics in Quebec to have uh, a bishop, and our our New England brethren uh, found that very offensive. <laughs> You know, but here in the end, you know, the, the Southerners in this case, uh, you know, New Jersey, New York, uh, Virginia, and, and on down south saying, you know, no, no, we don't, we don't got to be quiet about that. We need Spain and France on our side. And they are, after all, Catholic countries. And um, so uh, there's the great irony of that. And um, then I want to say about the, the, the Sons of American Revolution and Daughters of American Revolution, Mer American Revolution. Um, they, um, and, and it has something to do with my book coming out. Uh, they invited, before, while I was writing the book, they heard about my research and invited me to write an article for their national magazine, which I did. And as a result, the Daughters of the American Revolution were the first. Women are always ahead of the game. Um, and they granted uh, uh, membership uh, to Hispanic uh, soldiers and descendants of, of the Hispanics who, who uh, who participated in the war. The sons then saw that and followed that uh, same thing. So both of them now admit uh, um, Spanish descendants into their organizations. And one of the interesting things is there's a great big chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution in Madrid, Spain today. Um, and so there you go with that. And probably the lasting and most obvious uh, effect of, of uh, Spain's involvement in the revolution has to do with money and the Spanish coat of arms. Oh, man, that's beautiful. Boy, that's the best one I've ever seen. Good job, Don Carlos. <laughs> that's really good. This, this is on the Spanish flag today. This is the Spanish royal arms. The pillars of Hercules, which led to which, you know, our myth, Hercules and, and all that, but the pillars in, in geographical terms belong or are supposedly at the mouth of the Mediterranean Sea, that place where Europe and Africa are closest together. And of course, that's Spain. And so the pillars of Hercules are there, you know, on, on the royal symbol. Before Columbus sailed, incidentally, uh, the name in, in Latin there was Nun plus ultra, none passed here because the world ended. After Columbus sailed and they knew there was a whole new world out there, they changed it to plus ultra. Well, so much money was coming into um, um, the colonies before and during the war that uh, our accountants, and most notably Oliver Pollock in, in uh, New Orleans, would mark pesos by putting the two pillars of Hercules with the ribbons going through it. In other words, two lines with an S. That became our dollar sign, which is with us today, now with one pillar of Hercules. I, I will theorize that it's probably the Spanish side pillar. Um, but uh, so one of the lasting effects of Spain's involvement in our independence is our dollar sign. Moreover, so much Spanish money came in uh, that it became the basis of our new national coinage. Even before the war, um, colonies like Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Virginia, and a couple of others made Spanish coins their legal tender. In Spanish coins, the peso became so prevalent. Um, they're known in English, uh, we know them as pieces of eight. Why are they pieces of eight? Because they could be broken up into eight parts. You get your change, you know, you break them up rather than get different coins in pieces of eight. What's two eights? It's one quarter, right? One quarter is two eights. All the old people who are listening to me right now or watching me know what two bits means, right? Two bits is a quarter. That's where that comes from, two bits, two pieces of eight, two bits, eight bits make up a, a Spanish peso. And so that even in the language, the English language, the, the, the role of Spain in supporting our, our independence is there, pieces of eight. And so the issue of paper money became payable, and this is a quote, and some of the, uh, the paper money that you can get in museums and different places of uh, the first paper money were notes payable, quote, in Spanish milled dollars the value thereof in gold and silver. So um, all of this is evidence, um, even if you don't want to believe it, uh, that Spain was involved in our independence. And all this is to say um, that uh, even today, as we struggle with uh, trying to accept the other as part of our society, we were that from the beginning. 
we would not have become who we are had it not been for the help of other people and their finances. Uh, and they played not just little roles, but major roles that made it all possible. And so uh, from the birth of this nation, uh, we have debts to our neighbors and friends around the world and all their descendants who are now a part of us here. So now I'll answer questions. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Chavez. So we have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, uh, so Carol says, uh, terrific program. Uh, she wants to know if you have published these findings and if we can send a link of your bibliography to all the attendees. Oh, I, I, you can get the bibliographies in the book. <laughs> all right. And the book is available, I think, online. You can order it through uh, whatever, you know. Um, it's uh, Spain and the Independence of the United States, an intrinsic gift. Um, also, I've just published a, a book in Spanish in Spain that's uh, be coming out in English this year, uh, which is uh, it's called An Intrinsic Gift, uh, Benjamin Franklin Documents of the Archives of Spain, which is a collection of all the documents dealing with Benjamin Franklin's dealings with Spain. So the American Philosophical Society is publishing that bilingually in English and Spanish and some French, because they want to do the original documents in the original language with the translations. So that should be coming out sometime this year. Uh, but the book that has all the information I gave you now, I've updated a few things because um, I keep learning. You know, we all keep learning. Life is an education, as they say. Um, that's in, in my book, Spain and the Independence of the United States, as, as is the bibliography. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, we'll be sure to email all of our attendees um, a list of the books that you've written. Uh, Concha says uh, she wanted to know if you could talk about Juan de Morales. Uh, you did at the end of your presentation. Um, fascinating uh, history here. Um, Tom has a question about the money that was collected. Uh, he'd like to know if it was in Spanish gold coins or printed bills, um, and if that was converted to British pounds. How did uh, the colonies end up using that? Uh, it was never printed bills. It was uh, Spanish pesos. Um, as I mentioned, the pieces of eight and everything. Uh, no, it wasn't con never converted to, to British pounds, especially in the colonies. I mean, the colonies weren't going to do anything British uh, during the revolution or immediately thereafter. Uh, they started using it as a basis for their own, own currency. <clears throat> and uh, uh, the other thing is a, a lot of this came uh, not in coins, but in goods, right? Uh, one of the major goods in medicine I, I didn't mention was quinine. Um, the colonies didn't have quinine, and man, that was a valuable commodity and, and very important during the war. And Spain had quinine because it was invented in, in Peru. The quinine comes from the bark and the Peruvian trees, and um, the Spanish converted it to quinine, you know. And, um, and so that was very important, too. So um, Spanish coins and goods, but not printed uh, nor converted to, uh, you know, sterlings. <laughs> Great. Um, so David says, great, superb presentation. Um, they had no idea about the uh, about Spain's contributions. So I think all of us here learned a lot. Uh, he also wanted to know if any of the treasure that was destined to support uh, the United States was lost at sea in a shipwreck. Oh, you know, there's, there's a whole chapter that um, I, I kind of wrote in another book that's coming out someday um, about, um, you know, piracy in, in uh, Kosars and Kosars are, are you know, the, 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 uh, the navies of the different countries, uh, you know, there were formal navies, but the colonies didn't really have a big navy. So what they did was commission, uh, you know, ships captains to arm their ships and go take prizes, uh, which is what pirates do, right? Uh, only because you're at war, you'll take the enemy ships. Uh, but some of our guys were a little bit lax in identifying who was enemy or foe. And so there was all kinds of diplomatic full pause going on in that. Um, and uh, yeah, some of the ships uh, were either sunk or captured um, uh, at sea. Um, you know, Saavedra himself, when he was uh, sent to, to uh, Havana, his ship was captured. He was made a prisoner. 
Uh, and so they, he ended up in Kingston in, Jama in Jamaica, I want to say Jamaica, which is a Spanish term for it in Jamaica, um, which was you know, the guy so intelligent, of course, he observed everything and was able to draw maps and give accounts of, of you know, numbers of troops and cannons and everything. He got traded back, uh, you know, um, through merchants back to, to, to the uh, Spanish side and ended up in Havana with all this information. So his ship was captured and he had to offload all his official documents and uh, pretend like he was a merchant rather than a representative of the King of Spain. So yes, some of those ships were sunk and some were captured uh, on both sides. Great, thank you so much. Um, so another question from Lynn, how aware was the general public in the colonies during the war about the contributions of Spain? That's, that's a really good question. I don't really have an answer to that. Um, I know the founding, all the founding fathers knew. I know from their correspondence and everything. I mean, Robert Morris, for example, was corresponding with Spanish officials to get aid. He knew that. Uh, George Washington knew that. He was getting goodies from them. In fact, there's one great story where a whole shipment of uh, uniforms arrived in Boston and George Washington uh, sent his aide up there to pick, you know, to oversee the uh, transfer of the uniforms to his soldiers. And the guy came back empty handed. And George asked him why. And he says, they're all, the uniforms are all scarlet. You know, they're going to look like, <laughs> we're going to look like British soldiers. And, you know, so, you know, back then, I guess you had to wear your, your colors of your country. You can't wear, you know, like school colors today. Right. Uh, so you couldn't look like the enemy. And so they had to decline the shipment of scarlet uniforms. Um, it, uh, you know, it's a, I don't know how prevalent that was amongst the general public. Um, you know, the soldiers, to some extent, had to know that some of the clothes and even the weaponry, some of the swords. I, I found a sword in the West Point uh, Museum uh, that was a Spanish sword uh, that belonged to one of our officers. You know, so they had to know that it was a Spanish sword and where to come from. Right. Uh, so there's some of that. But uh, general, generally, I I don't think they really understood all of it. Uh, they, they, and that might be one of the reasons why we don't know the, the history today, because we did, you know, the general populace did know about the French soldiers. They were there. They could see them. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Chavez. Uh, we don't have any more questions in the chat right now. Carl, do you have anything on your side? Well, I was just thinking of the one of the first questions we got uh, from Concha, um, researching Miralles. I don't know if Tom's aware or not. I know that our, our partners here in Philadelphia, the American Philosophical Society, uh, I found some correspondence there about Miralles and uh, she might be interested to know that there was a portrait done of him by Charles Wilson Peel. And unfortunately, uh, we don't know where it is anymore. It went to Cuba and, and descended through the family of his wife, uh, the uh, last name Eligio de la Puente family. And it may still be there, but it's a little hard to get to Cuba these days and do research and about much. So, but there may still be a portrait out there. Uh, portraits of George Washington. There were several uh, by Peel that were sent to Havana as well during during and after the war. Yep. Thought you'd like to know that. That's a good one. Thank you. And then uh, Mary Francis just wants to say thank you for a wonderful program. Uh, she says, my father lived in Havana and my nephew in Mexico City. Uh, she's a descendant of Robert Morris and that her nephew will be very interested in a copy of this presentation in your book. So um, great talk. And I think everyone here learned a lot and uh, very appreciative of it. Well, thank you. Okay. Well, uh, I'll just say, you know, you can't hear us, but we're all giving you an applause right now. So thank you so much for your presentation and thank you to everyone for joining us this morning to hear it. So uh, this will be posted on the Trust website and on Facebook. So if you want to share it, please feel free. We'd love to have you share this out to everybody. So thank you again so much, Dr. Chavez. My pleasure. And to Carl. <laughs> thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Carl. Thank you. All right. All right. Thanks, Take everyone. Care. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.